Welcome to Mobilize, Launching and Sustaining Successful School Campaigns. Um, I'm Sarah Mojla. I'm a statewide education advocate with Public Council, and my co-presenters are Rob McGowan and Kevin Bogus. Um, Rob will have to leave, unfortunately leave a little early, um, but his um, section is up first. Um, and if you have any questions, um, you can go ahead and ask them and we'll make sure that he gets to them and is able to answer them. Um, I do want to go through some logistical functions with you. At the right side of your screen, unless you've moved it, is the dashboard for GoToTraining. Um, what, what you will probably be most interested in is the chat function. If you have a question during or you know when we open for questions at the end, please go ahead and use that function to communicate with us. Everyone has been muted except for presenters um, and um, um, except for yeah presenters and organizers. Um, also, if you um, can see that you can, in case you're unable to use the chat function, um, you can um, raise your hand as well. And I see actually that someone has raised their hand and I um, sent a chat back to them. So if um, something is going on, Don, or if you can't hear something or, or you have an issue with any function, go ahead and um, let me know. Um, and um, with all of that, we'll go ahead and start. Also, one more thing, I wanted to let everybody know that um, this, um, this webinar is being recorded. So if you know someone who's missing this or they're running a little late, they will be able to get this on the fixschooldiscipline.org website um, a few days after we run it through the editing software and upload it. All right, great. So with all of that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, to open, I just wanted to um, let everybody know about the How We Can Fix School Discipline Toolkit. So a lot of, um, of teachers and educators and, and, and community members had uh, approached us about how to start um, you know, fixing school discipline or how to advocate for fixing school discipline in their communities. And so from that, the Fixed School Discipline Toolkits were born, and they have ready-to-use tools for advocating for um, and implementing alternative discipline strategies. So if you're a community member or a parent who is interested in different strategies, um, you can pick up the Fixed School Discipline Toolkit for community members, and there are lots of different tools in there. And Alternatively, if you're an educator who's wondering about the alternative strategies that work in classrooms to keep kids in school but also accountable for their behavior, you can pick up the Fixed School Discipline Toolkit for educators and, um, and use that as well to you know, create alternatives in your schools. They are downloadable um, at fixschooldiscipline.org um, slash toolkit. And as you can see here, sorry for the miniature jump. Um, if you, most of the uh, orange and underlined um, text in this webinar is actually hyperlinked, and so it'll take you to the pages um, in our um, in our website. Um, so you can see here there there's the community toolkit and the um, educator toolkit. Um, we are in the process of updating the toolkits right now and um, and making sure that they. Um, are, they have all of the new stuff from this past year, and so there are no hard copies currently, but when, they will be ready in January. So you can also contact me for a um, for an um, an uploaded um, an updated sorry toolkit. Um, and so with that, we are going to get into our webinar today, which is a webinar about launching and and sustaining and and um, and mobilizing um, to fix school discipline, to ensure that students are staying in school and receiving the supports that they need instead of being you know, suspended and expelled um, for various things. Um, so um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Rob, who just told me he can stay longer, which is really great. Um, I am going to turn it over to Rob to talk about um, the efforts of cadre 
in Los Angeles. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, it's, as an organizer, it's kind of hard not to get that immediate feedback from folks being in the room, but, you know, um, I'll try. Um, for those who don't know, Cadre is a um, is a, a nonprofit organization, um, organizing organization who um, organizes parents here in South Los Angeles, African American, Latino uh, parents of color, low income, and we are focused on um, uh, derailing the schools, derailing the school to prison pipeline, um, challenging push out, challenging zero tolerance and harsh discipline. And we, we do that because we see as th those things are the things that affect um, children of color, especially African-American students, the most. Um, and so a few years ago, Codger's been around 12 years, and a few years ago our parents decided to um, decided that how structural racism plays out in education is at the moment that teachers and students are having um, there, wh whatever conflict that is in the classroom, and it's playing out negatively, disproportionately against African American students. Um, so therefore, we decided, our parents decided actually, to focus on the discipline as a way to not only uh, challenge structural racism, but to decrease the negative impacts that discipline has been having on African American students. Um, so as you see on the slide, and in, um, so, so one way that we wanted to try to raise up the issues that were happening in the communities and, 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 and make them more powerful is to look at uh, participatory action research as a way to uh, not only tell the stories of uh, the issues that were happening with parents and students in, in, in South LA in the schools and in the classrooms, but also have um, the, the technical research behind it to, I don't want to say legitimize, but um, outside of the stories that are happening in our communities, um, once you frame them a certain way, as in reports, <laughs> with uh, backed up by data and backed up by professionals, whether it be academic or whether it be advocates, then so you know the world kind of sees it as being more legitimate. So, um, so our parents decided to um, embark on on how we do our work will be one of the strands of our work will be to use participatory action research as a way to support um, not only the families that, that are going through the things that they're going through, but also, um, like I said, to, and I hate, the word, I hate to use the word legitimize, but to frame things in a way um, for other communities where they can understand it better. Um, our first effort was we interrupt this crisis um, in 2004, um, which, it, you know, as if people don't know, participatory action research, we use surveys, we use um, focus groups, and, and we talk to folks about what's happening in their communities, what's happening in their classroom, how's that been affected, how's that affecting them, how's that affecting their children, how's that affecting their learning, the environment, and, and what we do, we take those um, um, those results and we uh, frame them and shape them and, and try to see um, what are the specific areas that are affecting um, that we could focus in on, hone in on, and come up and make recommendations to, to address them. Um, our second one was in 2006. Um, and then um, actually something happened in 2007 that was um, that was really important. Uh, next slide, actually. Next slide. Yeah. So in 2007, um, the Los Angeles Unified School District passed this policy called the Discipline Foundation Policy. Um, and what it was, it had this this um, research based a thing called school wide positive behavior support as its framework. Um, now. When we talk about structural racism and getting at the issues that are happening in the school regarding discipline, we, we won't say that school-wide positive behavior support is the end-all, be-all, and we won't say that it's the magic bullet to solve all the problems that's happening in schools. But what it did allow our parents to do was it allowed them to be able to look at 
disaggregated discipline data at the school site level that allowed them to be on school-wide positive behavior support teams that gave them the opportunity to not only review and analyze that data, but also to be able to give input and recommendations. And we felt like those two things, to be able to look at data and to be able to be at the table to uh, be a part of that analysis and be, be able to give some feedback and, and recommendations were key in um, elevating the, the power, um, so to speak, not so to speak, but actually the power of parents, you know, at the school site level. Um, and so we felt like if parents were at the table, being able to um, look at, see, uh, analyze, um, disaggregated discipline data, and they will, they will be right there because their kids are involved, they're in the community, they're around the schools, they're in the schools, to be able to give some positive feedback, to give some positive recommendations that, you know, if the school was listening, then um, they, they can see that change, that they can see the input that they're giving that would change the school and transform the school. So we felt like those, that in itself, those actions in itself were, could be positive, could be powerful, could be transforming, especially for the parents who are going through that process, especially for the, the school administration who if they really wanted um, parents involved, you know, this is a way that is, is district mandated that you know they, they can really harness the partnership and collaboration with parents and community. Um, are there any questions? <laughs> webinar is a little different. I guess we we'll wait questions for later. Yeah, but um, <laughs> everyone and everyone. Yeah, that's true. But everyone can chat during. You know, if there are any questions, you can go ahead and ask questions during. And I'll definitely, um, and since I think I might be the only one who can see, well, maybe not. Rob might be able to see them too. But um, the it, when a question comes up, I'll definitely, um, I'll, I'll read it out, okay? I'll interrupt you. Okay, great. <laughs> okay great. cool. No problem. Um, um, next slide. Yes. And what's important about... Um, the, the the piece that I want to convey uh, right now is, is the role of our legal partners, and it's very important. Um, we, our legal partners um, at the time, and, and still is at this time, um, <laughs> they still are at this time, are public counsel and uh, mental health advocacy services. Um, they were key in being able to um, our last report that we did, our last statistical action research project that we did in 2010, um, our, our advocates and partners, our advocate partners were key in being able to help us not only do the research because we grabbed every single um, piece of information that the school district had about how they were implementing school-wide positive behavior support um, at that point over the last two to three years. And to be able to compile that information, to be able to put it in a way to where um, our parents could, could, could be able to look at it and analyze it is very key. I mean, that's something that as organizers we couldn't do, we didn't have the time to do. Um, but our advocates were, were, were key in, in not only looking at compiling that information, but also thematically looking at some things. They were telling us, giving us in, input on things that they were seeing. Um, I mean, the, the technical piece, the legal piece, and, and asking for information and not getting it. And so we have to legally take the legal channels to get information back. Um, really, and, and then talking to us and figuring out what are some of the key things that we were feeling, what are our parents are seeing, what are their students are seeing and feeling in schools, and what are the best ways to, to kind of, what, what are the best types of information to ask for. Oh, Rob, um, we have a question. Sorry yeah, to interrupt. Yeah. We no, no um, so the question is um, is from Richard. Thank you. How different is positive behavior support from a restorative discipline model? Um, and um, and that they kind of likely sound like two different names for similar philosophies. Um, but I know that we're also going to get into a little bit of the, um, you know, after we talk about this a little bit more, we're also going to get into the um, School Climate Bill of Rights, which kind of talks about restorative justice as well. So I would actually just preliminarily answer um, that, um, that 
that restorative justice and positive behavior intervention and support are different, but I would like Rob to go ahead and, and, um, and further um, elaborate. Yeah, yeah, you know what, that's, that's an excellent question. I'm glad you asked it, Richard, thank you. Um, a, a lot of times people see uh, uh, positive, SWPBS, I'll just say that because it's quicker for me, SWPBS or SWPBIS or PBIS, that wasn't quick at all, um, <laughs> as, diff <laughs> as being different from restorative justice practice. <clears throat> but they're not. Actually, you need what we feel like. You need uh, the structure of SWPBIS to even get to the point that you're using restorative justice practices. So for instance, PBIS says, okay, you're not supposed to, you, you need to use alternatives to suspensions or class removals. So one of those alternatives could be, okay, um, there's some issues or incidents that are happening in classrooms and how are we gonna solve or, or, or solve those issues or, or get to the bottom of those issues won't be that we'll kick a kid out of class for a couple hours or a couple of days. What will what it'll end up being is that we can use some alternative means such as restorative justice, transformative justice as our allies from um, Youth Justice Coalition say, um, use those type of practices to um, handle those situations. So they go hand in hand. They're, 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 we don't see them as being different or, or one is better than the other. We feel like actually if we want to change the school culture and the environment, then we need them both. So yeah. Yeah, and I, I think to add on or clarify um, also what I was saying is um, while some, so it, it, there are different models in a lot of schools. So some schools use just PBIS, some use just restorative justice, some use both, some use, you know, other programs even. And what is really helpful about positive behavior support is that it's a, is a framework to get everybody on in the whole school on the same page about what their um, their processes are and there are different tiers of intervention um, so on a first t on a on a basic level everybody is engaged in the teaching of positive behavior expectations and in the reinforcement of behavior and then you know students who need a little bit of more intervention or having a a little bit more struggling with their behavior as a result of other outside, you know, outside or internal issues, um, receive different interventions. And those interventions can be restorative justice. Um, and they can be social emotional learning and all sorts of different um, um, things. And so they definitely work so well together, as Rob was saying, that they're very complementary. And that, um, and it's really helpful that, you know, Cadre doesn't, you know, in the, your work, you didn't see that as being, you know, two separate, separate things. Um, right. And we have another question. Um, someone wanted to get more information on mandatory professional development. Who is trained and by whom? Um, I think um, that that is a question for you. Oh, um, well, it, it, in the, that's one of the things that we've advocated for because um, if, if you have a district, well, we have a district who says that this is their policy um, and this is the framework they're using, what we found out in our participatory action research is that um, with our um, surveys to not only um, uh, parents but also with teachers and students and administrators that, you know, many didn't know what SWPBIS was. So mm -hmm. that that became an, another handle for us to use as far as our advocacy and our organizing to say, hey, listen, district, this is your policy. Um, this this is a culture change, this is an environment change, and in order for this to be successful, um, all of your people need to be trained. Um, so again, that's, that's one of the things that we've been pushing for and, and are still advocating and fighting for um, in LA. Yeah, perfect. Um, and um, and we are going to get to a little bit more of the you know the work that um, that Cadre is doing um, in partnership around um, implementing also restorative justice in um, Los Angeles. Um, I was going to just um, piggyback on what you were talking about with the role of legal partners and um, and just that you know Cadre did all of the you know this ground like up up until 2007 and, and eight, 
actually up until 2008, Cadre was doing all of the work with the participatory action and, and canvassing and talking to thousands of parents and doing all of that work. And so what what came in, and um, I know you were, Rob was having some uh, some hesitation with using the word legitimize, and the word I like to use is translate. So so when 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 parents and no and I I'm not saying that there's a right or wrong way to do it. I'm just saying that when you know parents have um, have power and they have voice and when they speak, sometimes there is a tendency on behalf of policymakers to to kind of not listen. And so the 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 role of legal partners in that position would be to um, to kind of translate what they're saying in in the scarier legal way um, that people often listen to. So that they're, you know, pe people, a lot of times policymakers are not, are not listening to parents until, or not until, but they're not listening to parents as closely as they should until it's translated in a language that they understand and then they start seeing things. And so I think that's kind of a, a lot of the the role that legal partners can play as well as, you know, through different connections being, um, being, uh, knowing different policy makers and, and being able to testify about different, you know, different features of, of, um, <clears throat> a policy and being able to basically, as I said, translate legal mumbo jumbo. So translate, you know, the, the, the things that policymakers are saying or, or, or putting, you know, into um, writing and documents or, you know, in negotiations about, say, as a, a, a resolution, we can translate all of those, those legal words so they make sense and educate people about their rights. And then on the other end, also translate the concerns of people we represent, like parents, to um, to other um, policymakers, does that kind of is that kind of the tension that you were you were working with, Rob? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I was just trying to help. Help. Um, okay. So um, I, I guess that covers covers pretty much everything on that slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So um, moving on to the lessons Cadre learned. Okay. Um, I could blow these out, and uh, if anyone needs to to really know what we mean by each one, but um, and I I could briefly for each one. So there was a, one of the lessons learned that we needed built-in incentives to ensure faster implementation, parent and student community participation. So what does that mean? <laughs> that means that on um, incentives may look one way to to the school district uh, may look. You know, another way on, in the classroom, they look away by the school. But um, it, we need it to, school just, I'll just be candid with all of you because we're all close friends now. The schools are, don't want to look bad at the end of the day. I mean, we've learned that in, in our organizing. So we needed to basically work in partnership to say, listen, it, this is what we're doing. We're, we're going to press on these pieces that are mandated by policy. At the same time, whenever you're doing well and things are, and expenses are going down, or or your use of alternatives are going up, we're going. Or there are some schools that need to be highlighted that are doing well. Administrators that are taking leadership that are doing well. Then we'll, we'll talk about it and and we'll highlight that and publicly say that these are some of the things that are going on. Um, so um, those type of things uh, need to be talked about and, and built in. Um, um, I can get, I mean, the specifics that we, you know, have to talk about now. Um, second thing is implementation needs to mean more than training and checklists and documents need to be created. This is a big thing because the main thing of that, Again, SWPBIS, it's a, it's a, it's a framework, it's a, it's a mind frame, it's, it's, it's a move away from, it, it's, a, it's a totally different thinking about looking at situations that happen in the school site level, on, in the classrooms, uh, what's happening in the relationships between students and teachers and students and staff. So it's really a mind frame, and you can't just say, well, um, we've had the meetings, 
We've had some parents show up. We've had some students show up. Here's our checklist and documentation of those meetings. So we're doing it. Oh, we put up some signs around campus that say, um, be respectful, be fair, be X, Y, and Z. So look, we're doing it from the walls. That, that's not necessarily what implementation means. And, and that was something that we had to, and we're still um, on an ongoing basis having that dialogue with, with the district saying you know, that it, it's not just that. that. Those are some, some outcomes that, that you may see that shows you that things are happening, but but the, the basic, the, the real outcomes show in, in in the environment, how the students feel about the school, how they feel about their their relationships with their with their teachers and, and, and the staff. Um, what are the numbers on suspensions look like? What type of uh, what are numbers on expulsions look like? What are the the actual alternatives to suspensions and classroom moves that are working? Um, how do you communicate that with different people? For different students or, or different teachers or administrators that may be struggling with um, having high numbers of out of classroom removals or high numbers of suspension. So it, it's, it's more than just a checklist. And, and many times, you know, when you talk about programs and, and, and dealing with the, the school districts, um, that's, that's their measure of things are working in the fair doing things. Um, so it's more than that. Um, the benefits of school-wide positive behavior support, SWTBIS, need to be made clear. Listen, it, it, it's the better in the schools. It, it transforms the school environment. More students are there in their seats. Um, your, <laughs> your funding increases because more students are there in their seats. Your, your, the, the test scores and the learning increases because more students are there in their seats. The environment has changed because you figured out different ways of how to handle those situations that happens in the classroom that normally, you know, a uh, kid would be sent out of class or sent home for a couple of days. And that affects the students in the, that are left in the classroom also because they're, they're, you know, observing what's going on. They're observing how you're handling these situations and, you know, and they're learning also. So, you know, that's, that's an important piece to, to, to kind of uh, bring up. Um, this is resource and funding need to be directed, need to be redirected. Again, um, people need training. People need follow up. Um, so, so that has to happen. People really need to know um, what this is and, and what it looks like. Um, it, it, one, one thing that we did, we partnered with the local district here, um, and we we got them to put some resources to say, hey, all of your your teachers and counselors that are on your school wide positive behavior support team, and your parents, invite them to a symposium which we had in here in South LA, and just for, at the time, local district seven, where it was, had like almost 300 folks show up and, and had training, did some trainings around uh, what positive behavior support looks like, not only in classroom, at home, and, and in different spaces. So it really kind of demystified this whole thing about what it was. So that took district resources and district leadership to say, this is important and we're gonna do that. Um, yeah, so um, policy mandate. <laughs> Policy should mandate schools to show evidence of alternative practices. Again, um, not just what's happening um, as far as finance sheets, but be able to document and say, listen, yeah, our, our numbers went down for our suspensions and classroom movies, but also how did they go down? And we're going to document how they went down. And we're going we're to not only show these practices and show how they went down, but we're going to share those with people and, and our teachers and administrators who may be um, struggling with, you know, the classroom management skills or whatever. So we have to be able to, um, schools have to be able to, to show what they're doing and be able to demonstrate what they're doing. And and, and again, it, it makes the school look better. You can say, hey, if a community group like our, like Cadre can come up and the parents say, hey, what are you doing? Yeah, we saw your numbers go down, but what are you doing instead of that? And people start hemming and hawing. Like, hmm, that doesn't sound great, but if you can say, hey, this is what we're doing, and, and the students at the school say there's evidence for this. Yeah, things are different around the school, things, things, and, and, and that's just evidence that things are getting better. Uh, parents need a direct way to complain and get response and implementation not happening. Again, it, it's a mechanism to set up to, to hold schools accountable to say, listen, things aren't happening the way they're supposed to, policy mandated way. Um, wise and how are you going to get feedback from parents? Hey, if you're not having these team meetings where parents are supposed to be there, parents aren't, 
your complainant's pants aren't showing up. So those pants that are experiencing things, here's the way that they can um, uh, vocalize or, or, or complain to the district or the school and say, here's some things we need to work on. And those this list of things that the school can look at and say, this is how we can um, zoom in and, and focus on some things that we are seeing, that are, we're getting feedback from the community and from parents. And these are issues that we need to be working on. All right, great. Um, um, and um, can you then um, talk about then, you know, how the lessons you learned from the foundation policy um, um, have translated into what you guys are working on now? Um, yes, last May, um, in, a, in conjunction with, with partnership and collaboration with uh, uh, the Brother Sun Cell um, Coalition here in, in South LA with um, other community partners that were collaborating on that, public council was involved, um, we got a chance to um, push for it and got passed the School Continent Bill of Rights um, last May, um, which was for our work, it ended up being, we, we ended up, got a, we, we got a chance to focus on some of the things that weren't necessarily working so well with the SWTIS, um, this, this foundation policy. So some things we pushed for and, and came up in the school common bill of rights is um, big thing around data, okay, data sharing, transparency. The, um, school does, the schools and districts are supposed to share disaggregated uh, this one data on a monthly basis. Um, again, it gives us a chance to really see the issues and pinpoint the issues that are happening in the school and the school district and give some feedback and recommendations and, and analysis about how to address those. Um, it, it mandates that <clears throat> schools should be using restorative justice practices by, in, in, with, you know, 2015 by 2020, all schools should be using those. Um, which, which is great, you know, another alternative to um, classroom rules, another alternative to um, suspension, in school and out of school suspension, and really trying to look at ways to resolve issues at, and, and the root cause of issues that are happening in school and improve the school environment. Um, looking at uh, the school continuity right also restricts the role and, uh, of police on campuses, which is great. I mean, a lot of times, Again, when you have staff who aren't trained um, around these type of restorative practices, the things they result to are, you know, just could be, hey, can you call the police? Because I don't know how to handle the student. I don't know how to handle the situation. And the police end up being called, and which, which is inappropriate. Um, so those are the main things. Um, it solidified ways to um, appeal suspension. I mean, there's some great things that are in the school kind of bill of rights, um, so I, just for the interest of time. But uh, but the biggest thing was to eliminate suspensions and expulsions for willful for the fire, um, which is, as we've seen over the course of our um, participatory action research, even back in, in 2009, when our after, before report came out in 2010, our parents were looking at suspensions and why kids were getting suspended and saying, hey, you know, this, what is this rule for defiance thing that was the highest reason, the rationale that kids are getting um, sent out of class and suspended, and no one could specifically say what it was, and it's basically this catch-all for anything from not being prepared as far as pencils and pen in schools to wearing, not being in uniform to, to you know, you, you just get on my nerves right now, um, can, <laughs> can you get out? So you, you got that taken off the table. So um, that was the biggest, the biggest uh, part of that. Thank you. Yeah, um, great. And also, so um, we do have a question that's really helpful for um, for all everything that you've talked about. And I just wanted to point to, again, that these, um, these uh, orange and underlined things are um, hyperlinked. And so when you click on them, for instance, if you click on the school discipline policy and school climate bill of rights, it actually takes you to the actual policy. So just um, for, you know, FYI, but there's a really great question that um, is about kind of generally what you've been talking about. Um, and the question is, do you use different strategies to secure teacher buy-in from those that you use to secure administrator buy-in? And were you able to enlist teacher union support? 
It was kind of. Oh man, that's a great question. That's a yeah. Great question. Um, you know, it's interesting that <clears throat> in our organizing, we've seen that um, you know these, these different type of camps kind of almost pit each other against each other, right? So if if, if we're as advocates, as parents, if we're in the room and we're talking to administrators, they're like, oh, the teachers this, and parents that, or oh, the teachers say, you know, administrators, uh, we don't get enough support. But um, but what we try to do is say, hey, listen, this, we're trying to change the culture and 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 the environments of schools, and and this is an important way to do it. This is a different way to look at things. So we have engaged the local teachers union. We have engaged. Um, rank and file teachers also, in addition to um, uh, specific teacher union officials, um, and yeah, I, I think the conversation has to be tailored to, to them. I mean, I think that's that's part of organizing. And and the thing is, like, you know, wouldn't it be great to have additional skills on how to manage your classroom, and you know, even in the event to where not only students and the guys are acting up or acting out for whatever reason that may be. Um, but also when you're having a bad day or you're not feeling so well or, you know, we, you know, having those type of skills to be able to, to continue to manage your classroom setting, to continue to have the time to, um, to, to do what needs to be done in the classroom with learning and also to be able to strengthen the relationships between you and your students. So that's, it's a it's a little more it's, it gets nuanced as we go back and forth between rank and file teachers to actually teacher union, but that's basically what we're talking about. Yeah. Um. And I, I as a piggyback, I'm wondering, have you also, you know, a piggyback question that I think might be coming up is, have you also um, experienced some? Um, pushback with, with some of the, the work that you've done recently. So with some of, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think um, um, we've experienced pushback. A, the teacher saying, hey, we, this is, it's our right to suspend. It's our right to remove a kid from a classroom. And, and we get the type of questions. We get, we get the extreme questions about, you know, a kid brings a grenade in the class. I mean, you know, it's it's been so not, not that extreme, but we we get some extreme questions around um, these um, situations in classrooms, and and get always asked, well, what about that? And I would say, well, listen, um, if you, you've got to look at kids as human beings, and you've got to look at them as little adults, you got to look at them as having issues that that you know similar issues that you may not be able to relate to or may not, you may be able to relate to. Either way, you know, it's a little person, you know what I mean? And we, we have to think differently about kids and think differently about their actions and, 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 and acting out. Um, so yes, we've gotten pushed back. People say we're crazy, but at the end of the day, um, these are, we're a parent organization. These are their kids. And so, you know, and and as a as a community, as a culture, we need to figure out how to support each other and and, and resolve issues in better ways. And and it, and it comes down to that: how to resolve them in the classroom, where things are you know where the rubber meets the road per se. I mean, I'm, I don't want to take up too much time, but yeah, we we've, we've gotten pushed back from from teachers. We've gotten pushed back from administrators saying we don't have the money, we don't have the time from principals saying we don't have the money, we don't have the time, um, but but it comes down to a mind frame. Um, I know everybody doesn't organize around human rights like we do, but it's still, it's, it's still a mind frame, it's, and, and it's about caring about kids, it's about our society. It's, I don't want to go too deep, but anyway, yeah, we, we, we get pushback all the time. And the major pushback is, is probably going to be around this issue of, of not being able to spend for wolf defiance. Maybe or maybe, may or, the union may or may not, you know, have some say about that, but um, they've already expressed that they felt like they weren't at the table <laughs> around putting these things in the, the school common bill of rights, but it's a community-led effort. So not saying the teachers aren't part of the community, but, you know, the politics of it all, it, it makes things a little different. Okay, awesome. 
Um, so I um, received a couple of just logistical questions about the links in the PowerPoint. Um, they are clickable, but not on the not on the screen. So the screen that you're seeing right now is actually not um, interactive. You just can see it. Um, however, if you look in the materials section on your dashboard, you can download the um, download the PowerPoint that we're using, and that PowerPoint should be clickable. If you're unable to, you know, go through and use these, you know. These links, I do have um, a PDF version that is also is also usable as well. So um, please feel free to um, email me afterwards, and and we'll um, I'll go ahead and get that out to you. Um, and let's see. Okay. Um, so I I don't see any further questions for Rob right now. Um, but if you do have some, um, go ahead and um, uh, go ahead and continue to use your chat function. Um, we now have um, Kevin um, Kevin Bogus, um, who is a um, an associate director of organizing um, with Coleman Advocates um, for Children and Youth. And so I'm going to turn things over to him so he can, um, you know, talk about the, the steps that they've used. Super. Thank you so much. Um, once again, my name is Kevin Bogus. I'm the Director of Civic Engagement at Coleman Advocates for Children and Youth. Um, just so folks know, uh, Coleman Advocates is based in San Francisco. Uh, we work in the southeast section of the city, uh, which is where there's the predominantly African-American as well as working class communities in San Francisco. Uh, we've been doing this work for over 30 years. We've been around for 38 years dealing with issues around juvenile justice uh, and as well as education, housing, um, and employment issues for uh, people of color in San Francisco. Um, so yeah, a little bit, I guess, if you want to go to the next slide. Cool. Um, so a little bit about what we've done with regards to restorative practices in San Francisco's Unified School District. Uh, in 2008, Coleman Advocates launched our A through G campaign, uh, really with a focus on trying to close the achievement gap. Uh, a lot of students in SFUSD historically uh, who are African American or Latino were essentially placed on tracks that didn't lead them into college. Uh, as a student who went to school uh, in SFUSD and experienced that personally, uh, only having one college counselor for the entire school, uh, and that counselor not necessarily doing everything it takes to make sure that all students uh, have access and the opportunity to go to college, uh, whether it was because of preferences that she had or because of the fact that there just were too many of us and not enough of her. Uh, so Coleman won that campaign victory, uh, and the district has been implementing it slowly. This is actually the first year of the first graduating class that has the A through G graduation requirement, um, and there is a lot of drama around that because the implementation didn't happen fully. So at uh, continuation schools, which are pretty much the only schools in San Francisco that are majority African American and Latino. Uh, they didn't have the classes offered for those students uh, to even graduate with the requirement, uh, which caused a little bit of craziness around trying to uh, adjust the system and find ways to ensure that everyone has access uh, to the classes they need to graduate or another way for them to get their diploma. Uh, and I'll kind of talk about this a little bit more when we talk about uh, our current campaign work. Um, on October 19th, 2000, October 2019, uh, there was a resolution called the Comprehensive School Climate Restorative Justice and Alternatives to Suspensions and Expulsions, which is a really long title to say that the school district was going to start investigating the use of restorative, ja restorative justice in the classrooms and in the schools, um, which was a really big victory for us. We really viewed it as a real positive step um, towards changing the negative climate that students of color felt at school and experienced. Uh, between 2012, 2013, and 2010, there's been a 30% reduction in overall suspensions. And um, we can go to the to the next slide. But 
we still have a situation where African-American students are being suspended at rates much greater than their peers. Um, so what you see on the slide in front of you uh, is the proportion of enrollment for African-American students at individual high schools in San Francisco versus the proportion of suspended students that are African-American students. Um, so the green bars, uh, like if you look at Independent Studies Academy, uh, African-American students make up just 24% of the enrollment at that school, but account for about 80% of all the suspensions. Uh, and that's pretty much true for all of the high schools that you see that gap between the enrollment numbers and the proportional numbers. Uh, as a whole in the district, African Americans make up about 10% of the whole district, but they account for 50% of all the suspensions. Uh, and when you add Latinos to that combination, that number jumps up to 77%. Um, so we can maybe jump to the next slide. And this is showing the exact same thing for middle schools. Uh, and it's, it's equally as true for, um, for elementary schools as far as the suspension numbers, but not proportions, because our elementary schools in San Francisco are really racially segregated, uh, primarily because of the neighborhoods they're in and also just kind of how schools work in San Francisco. Okay, so what we're working on right now, um, and we're hoping to see uh, our first victory in this long fight to, to end the, the harsh treatment for students of color uh, with our Solutions Not Suspensions campaign. Um, currently, SFUSD is 147th of 148 in school districts on performance level among students of color. Um, even though we are one of the highest performing urban school districts in the state, that just does not hold true for African American, Latino, and Pacific Islander students. Uh, we don't graduate at the same rate. We drop out a lot more and we get suspended a lot more often than anyone else in the school district. Um, and so these, these, these data points just reference that we're 126 to 26 in the size of the gap between African American and Latino students. African American and white students, and 142nd and 143rd for Latino versus white students. Um, the current campaign that we've launched, uh, that public council has been providing us support in, uh, through all the different great things that they do, uh, it, it is really centered around changing the dialogue and the discussion around discipline to not being about punishment, but being about accountability. Um, and I think that's been one of the, the bigger struggles that we've had. Yeah. Um, uh, in our conversations um, with uh, a board member uh, of the Board of Education in San Francisco, Commissioner Matt Haney, uh, we initially had some conversations uh, around willful defiance suspensions. Uh, he had brought to the board a, a resolution to support AB 420, uh, which ended up not becoming law. Um, but we did support it locally, which made us feel like we could possibly do something similar uh, in San Francisco. Two years, actually two and a half years prior, we did a, a public records request asking for discipline data from SFUSD. And what we essentially got were a whole bunch of individual sheets of data that weren't compiled or organized in any useful way. Uh, and just the sheer quantity made it really difficult for us to use the information. And a lot of it was piecemeal, so we had some schools but not a real full look at the district using consistent indicators for us to really make an analysis. So we were able to see that the numbers were bad, but we weren't really able to gauge exactly how horrible they were. Um, but via um, Matt Haney, Commissioner Matt Haney's interest uh, in looking at ending willful defiance, we were actually able to get more accurate data at the beginning of this school year back in um, August, uh, which pretty much laid out the picture that African American Latino students were pretty much exclusively being suspended at all of the grade levels in the school district. Um, from that, we, we had a conversation with our membership at Coleman Advocates. Uh, we have uh, three different organizing programs. We have a Parents Making a Change group that focuses on organizing parents in elementary schools uh, to advocate for their kids' rights within the school. Uh, and we also have a Youth Making a Change, or a YMAC, which organizes high school students uh, around the issues in their school and their community that they're passionate about. And we also have a community college organizing group called Students Making a Change that's based out of City College of San Francisco. Um, so our Parents Making a Change and Youth Making a Change groups came together um, and crafted four demands that we use to uh, 
basically flush out what we wanted to see in the resolution um, that was that's going to be brought before the Board of Education this Tuesday. Uh, we've had a lot of different talks with a lot of the key stakeholders, teachers, teachers in the teachers union that and other groups of teachers who organize outside of the teachers unions, um, administrators at the school, students, parents, uh, and just pretty much anyone in the community who will listen to us. Um, at this point, we have had over 26 organizations sign on to endorse our campaign. Um, and we're really excited. Uh, we've met with three of the commissioners on the Board of Education who, who isn't Matt Haney who helped put it forth, and they sound really supportive. Uh, and the president of the board felt really confident that uh, we would be able to find a way to get some aspects of the resolution through the Board of Education. Uh, I think the most interesting aspect for us, and it probably was the most predictable, uh, is the biggest issue that people are having is with the fact that uh, they don't really want to acknowledge the fact that racism exists in the school district and that the, there are people inside the school district who are, who are able to instigate that because the institution isn't providing enough supports to kind of remove those issues. Um, and so a lot of the conversations that we're having uh, in regard to our resolution center around the aspect that prevents um, principals from suspending African-American students without making uh, a verifying phone call to the associate superintendent or the superintendent's designee. Um, and, and really what that's about is saying that um, there's an issue with the way that African-American students are disciplined, and it's not fair. Uh, and we want to just make sure that we're monitoring the process to make sure that all the alternatives are being used. Um, and the, the issue that a lot of people have with that is they feel like in singling out African-American students is actually creating an issue uh, for everyone else. Uh, a lot of people have questions like, what does this mean? Do, do, do white students and other students not get the same type of treatment? And so our response to them has been really kind of straightforward as far as like the additional call to the district office that wouldn't be required, but all of the alternatives would still be mandated to happen before suspension. Um, and just to kind of talk through some of the other aspects that are in the resolution, um, we would want to see the full implementation of what we called earlier SWRPI or restorative practices and school-wide positive behavioral interventions and supports at all school sites. Um, right now, um, we'll post the resolution. We do have an office that actually does do restorative justice coaching and trainings for school staff, um, but there isn't an institutionalized way to monitor the progress and the success that they're having. And it's not at all school sites, which is really challenging. They actually don't have a model that they currently are using uh, for high schools, so high schools can't really participate. Um, and that's where a lot of these things kind of really come to a head, especially. Uh, another really big aspect of it was um, the tiers of intervention as alternatives to suspensions. Um, so one of the things that we're really looking forward to, to taking part in after the resolution passes, hopefully, is the, the process of creating that discipline matrix um, that really kind of makes it simpler for students, parents, and school officials to kind of understand what type of disciplinary action needs to happen based on the offense. Uh, and really is focused around creating community and bringing people together to talk about these things and to have a say. What we've experienced a lot is students especially feel like a lot of the rules at their school are unfair, whether the rule itself is unfair or the way that the disciplinary actions are leveled out is unfair. And the discipline matrix kind of solves that and also gives young people and their parents an opportunity to really have a say about what happens at their school. Um, one of the big issues that, that we've had, and it's the, the next point on the slide, is, is, is getting access to data. Um, the people in our district do a great job of creating charts and graphs that'll tell you no relevant information or will directly mislead you in understanding what's happening at the, in the school district. Uh, we want to see an end of suspensions for willful defiance from school. Uh, we're not necessarily focusing on out-of-classroom suspensions for willful defiance uh, because we didn't necessarily want to upset teachers any more than we already were. Uh, I know most of the teachers we talk to feel like they don't have enough tools as it is. And what we really want to do is, uh, what we really want to do is kind of have them 
Wow, I just totally drew a blank because of the cat. <laughs> um, so yeah, what we really want to do is really have them involved in understanding that releasing data means that the community can keep you accountable and we can all make sure that everyone is getting the best possible education. Um, so as we said earlier, the school district has been really successful at reducing suspensions. They've dropped 30% in the last three years. Um, but the racial disparity hasn't. Um, it's continued to stay unacceptably high. Um, the, the interesting thing about San Francisco is we have a relatively small African-American population within our schools. Uh, and a lot of the African-American parents uh, are preferring to take their kids out of public school and place them into either private school or charter schools uh, because they don't feel that they're going to get a good quality of education in the schools. Um, and so there's still issues with charter schools as well, but people feel a lot more trust and confidence in them. And we hope that this aspect of the resolution will show that that progress is being made and that parents can feel safe in bringing their kids back to SFUSD. Um, another aspect is making sure that we're monitoring the loss of instructional time. Um, there are a lot of alternatives to suspension that are used at schools currently um, that aren't official and may not necessarily be legal uh, and aren't documented at all. So anytime a student is taken out of class for disciplinary action, we really want to have that monitored so we can know whether or not um, these students are being served and educated or if they're being warehoused. Um, some of the other things are, are kind of basic, like we want a clear process for suspension appeals and whether or not students are getting access to PBIS and restorative practices at their school sites. Um, and we want to make sure that we have an implementation plan uh, that is created quickly but is efficient at making sure that all schools get access uh, to all these great things such as restorative practices and PBIS. And the resolution is actually being introduced on December 10th, and so we're going to be having an action out in front of the Board of Education. We're going to have speakers, and we're actually going to be meeting with the superintendent of the school district about the issue right before. Um, so it's a real exciting time for us as we get involved uh, to hopefully win uh, the first step in this campaign. I think the thing that we've learned uh, from our comrades in LA is that getting the resolution passed is really just the first step and that the work only continues and gets harder uh, after it's passed. And we have a really, really, um, thanks for that, um, Kevin. We have a really good question also, and I'm hoping that both Rob and Kevin can answer this. Um, so it, um, if our district is already moving into restorative discipline, is there still a necessary role for positive behavior intervention programming, or does PBIS become optional or unnecessary? So I think um, both of them have like really good answers. So I'll go to Kevin first. Yeah, so I would most definitely say that it, it's still necessary and really vital to have um, a successful restorative practice program. Uh, in San Francisco, we currently have uh, some pilot schools that actually are using um, restorative practices as well as some individual schools that have just taken it on themselves to just use restorative practices. Um, and restorative practices are really useful at dealing with discipline issues. Um, after they happen, but it doesn't do as much to prevent things from happening, and that's the, the big aspect, in my opinion, of what PBIS offers you. It offers you a chance to change the culture and the climate of the school, which will really help reduce the, even the need for restorative practices. So um, from our view, it's really necessary to work together uh, to really have a, a real difference um, at the schools. Yeah, and so I I'll pass that. Um, Oh, yeah, I would say I would, I would agree with that. I would also add that um, having some specific things in place as far as policy-wise gives um, parents and community groups and community a chance to, to hold district accountable to things. I mean, if they're just doing things at all, oh, things are better, what happens when things aren't better? Um, then the community groups and parents won't have something to fall back on to hold them accountable to continue to be doing things better. So um, if, if there's if, if the practices are changing and the culture of changing is changing, that's wonderful. That's great. Um, at the same time, you want something that will go beyond 
a certain administrator who's showing certain leadership um, or go beyond a certain, you know, uh, superintendent that's showing some leadership view on something that that'll last and that'll benefit way beyond personal personalities. Great. Thanks, Rob. And I just wanted to let everybody know that we are open for questions. Um, um, we've kind of, you know, finished up a little early. So if Rob or Kevin wants to add anything, they totally can. Um, and um, if anyone has a question, I will do um, some, um, some work on facilitating. I also wanted to let everybody know. So if we go back really quickly to um, or kind of just wanted to show you that this slide that has all of the information about fixschooldiscipline.org and you can add your contact information to our list. You can also um, email me directly if you have any questions um, or you're interested in receiving technical assistance and support, kind of like what we were talking about earlier from public counsel. But also if you're looking for advice about you know, if you're a community um, organizer, community member, a parent, anything, you can also contact Rob um, at Cadre and Kevin at Coleman to, you know, kind of talk um, talk you through um, um, some of the things that you're going through in your districts because they've, you know, they've done it. So, um, so, and that's a lot of what this Fixed School Discipline Project is about. It's about, you know, definitely connecting people and and um, and you know, connecting them to the discipline, fixing school discipline work that is happening throughout California. And I think that it's interesting too when you know when we were putting this together that I um, that that Rob is in LA and Kevin's in San Francisco, but they're still kind of you know feeding off of the different things that are happening in their area. So, um, and that sort of thing is really inspiring. All right, so I see a, a question from Richard and um, he's asking, what are the ways in which you identify the self-interest of teachers and administrators in order to get their buy-in on changing their policies? So I'll go to Rob first. We, we do landscape analysis and, and so we, kind of see what what things teachers are are backing, supporting as far as policies in the district, um, as far as things that are happening within the, throughout the district. But also it's about um, that's part of it and also it's about just asking. <laughs> I mean <laughs> just asking them. Um, I, I mean anything that we would do outside of, you know, just doing the, the landscape or power analysis would you know, which we rely on to a certain extent, would still be our assumptions, um, and which pretty much hold true. I mean, if you see teachers that are fighting against, or the teachers' unions are fighting against some of the things that that you know some of our allies are doing, as far as um, um, you know what they're doing with other youth, with some youth issues, then we can kind of gauge what the teachers are saying, kind of listen to what they're saying, what what are they putting, what are the talking points they're putting, putting out. Um, you know, so landscape analysis, power analysis, and, you know, if you have some some trusted folks that you can talk to that are teachers or teacher union folks, ask them. Yeah, I, I would just say that we were. Um, it, it, it was a little bit different for us. We, we met with uh, with the teachers union. We met with some. We, we met with a, a teachers group called Teachers for Social Justice that kind of represent like a progressive wing of the teachers. Um, and I, I think the thing about getting their buy in is that they care about the kids. And I mean, I think that's a place to, to start just by saying like, we have a problem and that the system isn't working. Um, most teachers we talk to agree that the discipline structure wasn't working and that the students were seemingly getting worse every year and that things were getting more difficult for them and it was preventing them uh, from doing their jobs as teaching. Um, I think the obstacle was getting them to, to believe that they and the administrators and parents and students could all come together and take part in the process to create something better. Um, we experienced a lot of, I guess, negativity and lack of optimism around the administration's ability to actually fulfill this promise 
um, and that this all would kind of fall on the heads of teachers and they'd be held responsible and they'd be blamed. Um, so for us, it was really about trying to have those conversations early with the teachers union and our teacher allies. Um, and then also kind of reassuring them that they're going to have a, a role to play in the process of creating this. Um, it's not just going to be something that's handed down to them, but that they will be able to engage in it. Um, and I feel like it's helped help some. I feel like there's still a little bit of um, reservation from from the teachers, but I feel like they don't want to go actively out of their way to try to try to shut this down because they, they can see the, the benefit of it. And there's kind of like a piggyback question to that, that um, Richard is asking that how, you know, some of the ways, if you want to elaborate just a little more on how you get you get teachers or, you know, administrators to see the benefits to them of not suspending kids? I mean, I would say in San Francisco, the, the numbers were just really crazily bad to the point where it was like there was a possibility that they, they could be, be sued. They're suspending. I mean, there was a high school that suspended half of their black students, um, which is really, really unacceptable. Um, in anyone's regard. So, I mean, I think for us that that helped get the conversation going, getting access to that data uh, and seeing that it was an issue really helped us to kind of push that conversation forward and bring people to the table. Um, and then I have a good question that um, from Gina that as Fresno has kicked off a restorative justice, they've been hearing of schools sending students home and not tracking them as suspensions. Um, so how have you addressed the practice of not tracking suspensions and expulsions accurately or honestly? And I'm going to turn this over to Rob because I think there was a, a little bit of that happening in, in L.A. Yeah, that's illegal. Um, <laughs> So, so what we did, we had conversations with our parents to, to ask them, um, hey, listen, you're, you're, oh, you said your kid was suspended. Okay, where's the paperwork? How do you know? Was it something official that you got from the school um, that said that your kid was suspended? How long? Um, and, and, you know, just from meeting with um, a local school here, a local high school here, I mean, we asked them straight up, what are your practices when you have issues at school, a parent has been called, at the point to where the student goes home with the parent, you know, is there some documentation that are happening? Um, did, was that something that was asked of the parent? Could you take your student home? And then, you know, the parent says, yeah, I'll take them home. And then they're thinking, oh, they just got some suspended for the rest of the day or, or there's no communication about when they come back, um, you know, that's, yeah, so, so we had to have some specific conversations with our parents who were experiencing this and saying, what was the process of that? What do you have specifically that shows documentation of um, that your student was suspended? And many times, oftentimes, it was, uh, yeah, you know what, can you come get them? Can you, come, can you take them home? You know, and, and technically, the school aren't supposed to be doing that. Especially with the parent not knowing that's what's happening, not knowing that the option was, no, you know, I, I want them to stay here and finish out the rest of the day, whether it's middle school, even especially middle school and high school when there are other classes that, that, that they, were, they could attend. Um, yeah, that was, it was really important for us to really dig through those situations and ask uh, about documentation. All right, thanks, Rob. That's great. Um, do you have anything to add, Kevin? I mean, it's just like it's similar to Rob. It's just, you know, trying to educate parents and students of what their rights are, um, whether it's unauthorized, like permits to leave uh, instead of a suspension. Or for, in San Francisco, we have a lot of warehousing of students in school, whether it's in a counseling office or in a, a wellness center, which are kind of like, uh, res like health resources, mental health, physical health resources on campus. I um, mean, so we're actually trying to trying to get the district to start documenting any time that loss of instructional time is happening, uh, so we can kind of catch when people are trying to uh, trying to cheat the system. And I just wanted to, um, and, you know, we're still open for questions. I did just want to um, let some of you who are asking some questions um, specifically about your districts um, that, you know, again, we're available. Public counsel is 
Cadre, Casey, I think we're available to, you know, talk and hash this out even further. Um, that uh, as a, so personally as a, a teacher, a former teacher, um, and now an education advocate, I think um, when you think about engaging teachers, um, it does take work because teachers have the, have a lot of the burdens of different, um, have seen all of the different programs that have come in and they've been made to implement that haven't worked necessarily. They have, um, you know, the, st the standards that they now have to implement, you know, different ones, you know, be it Common Core or some other thing that has happened. And then, so then when you are um, proposing that they do discipline a little bit different, I think a lot of what happens is, you want me to do this one more thing and how is it, you know, I'm going to spend all my time with discipline now. What am, you know, what am I doing? I don't have any time to teach my class. And, and a lot of what, you know, I think I remember <laughs> resonated with me or resonates with me now is that it makes your, it's easier to actually teach when you are able to engage with your students and you're not dealing with discipline the whole time. I think there has to be this question. How long do you spend dealing with, um, you know, discipline in your classroom now? So you're dealing with student behavior in your classroom now. How long do you spend teaching? And so when you start seeing that, you know, because they're, you know, in districts that have districts and schools with high suspension rates, you see that, you know, teachers are kicking kids out of class all the time because there is no structure. There is no framework for how to teach kids, you know, discipline, how to deal with all of the trauma that's happening to them when they come to to school and, and all of those different things. And so when you kind of have those real conversations with teachers about what they really need in their classroom, the, the, I think a lot of the um, motivations and a lot of the needs align. So the need to, you know, keep our kids in school aligns with the need to actually be able, when they're kept in school, to teach them. So, you know, if you're not suspending kids, they're in your classroom, you have to have some framework to deal with all of the things that they're dealing with and um, get the, get them ready to graduate and go on to college or a career. So that's kind of a, you know, a long way of saying um, that teachers can be really big allies. You just have to, um, you have to engage them kind of at the outset. It's, it's kind of helpful and to, and to get those, I, I, and I would have Rob and um, Kevin elaborate on this, but getting um, champion and ally teachers in at the outset if, they, if you have any advice about doing that. Um, yeah, I mean, I would I would just say, like, it's good to try to start that conversation early and to have the teachers understand that um, the, the real goal of this is to make classroom management issues um, school wide issues instead of just what happens between a teacher and a student, um, because that's where a lot of the problems start is uh, dealing with the situation in such an individualized way and at such a late point in the game. Um, so for us, it's been really about having those conversations, explaining to teachers it's about giving you more tools, not less. Uh, it's really about shifting the focus from being about punishment to being about education and teaching students when they do something wrong, why it's wrong, and how they can repair the harm they cause in the community by their actions versus just isolating them and pushing them away from school and uh, from education and uh, damaging their future. Rob, do you have anything else? Yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's a difficult, it's a tricky conversation to have. Again, you do need those type of advocates um, who, who kind of already understand um, the work that community groups and, and that, are, that we're doing and the, the framework and the lens that we're looking, that we're coming from. I mean, I think everything you said, Sarah, is correct about the, the feelings that teachers have about you know, everything is on their shoulders as far as, you know, all the ills of the education system are falling on the shoulders of teachers. I, you know, I'm, I'm not oblivious to say that they don't feel that way. Um, I do think what you said is correct, though, uh, what both of you guys have said is correct, is when you look at the, the type of supports that teachers may need, it's, it is a school-wide issue, it is a district-wide issue, it is a focus, it is a framework change, and to, to get teachers to see that and, and feel that they're being supported in, in certain ways to where they can get instruction going. And, and I'll go back to what I said earlier. Um, it, it also goes down to how you're managing this classroom. And, and if you're seeing, and if students are seeing how you're managing conflict, you know, they're learning from that. You know, and they're learning that, you know, good or bad, you know, 
they're, they're taking away from how you are conducting your classroom. So that's a teaching moment too. So you know, we we want to get um, we we want to kind of step out of the the box, the, the narrow box thinking of you know, oh, because we do get these extreme examples that teachers ask, well, what happens when this happens? Well, okay, I I don't have an answer for everything. I can't say all I can say is that. If we want to change our society, if we want to change things at a, at a root cause level, we have to be different in how we're doing things now because how, we're, how we've been doing things have got us here. So we need to be looking at things different. We need to be looking at our kids different. We look, need to be looking at how we're handling situations, in, in, like I said, not just classroom level, but school-wide level differently um, to create a different type of environment. And, you know, and that's what, if you look at... Uh, research-based um, um, approaches like um, SWPBS, that, that's one thing that they look. They say, hey, these relationships have gotten better. Um, things have gotten better in school, at, at school site level. And the evidence of this is more schools are, more students are, are in class, less suspensions, less expulsions. Um, their rates, their, um, their, their uh, academics have gone up. I mean, so all these things, all these votes of a change, and that change is, is something to really have to think about, and it's not necessarily these specific things that you do, like meeting and, and recording these meetings. It, it is a culture change. So you, you have to have these continuous conversations that, that, that are going against decades-long thinking and practices. Sorry, that was kind of long, right no, that was great. That was great. Um, so we have another question um, that's come in that's really good. And I don't know if you guys have um, done this, but has someone developed a list or recommendations of the actual supports with te which teachers need that restorative discipline and P or PBIS uh, provide? Um, or P Sorry, that restorative discipline or PBIS needs to provide to satisfy teachers um, that they'll benefit from the program. So kind of something that um, I'm, I'm going to translate a little bit, that something, a, a list that um, has recommendations of what um, supports teachers need that are provided through restorative uh, justice or PBIS. Um, I know on the fifth school discipline toolkits, we do have overviews of what those um, of what those uh, strategies look like on an overview, but not something specifically for teachers. And actually, I think that's a great thing that we should include. So thank you for the suggestion, Dave. Um, but maybe uh, Kevin and Kevin and Rob can can talk about something that you've you put together, maybe. So we don't we didn't have anything that we pulled together that kind of laid it out in the way that it w it was framed. The way that we've kind of been talking about it, um, it is really centered around the fact that we're in the process. It sounds weird of creating a process that teachers will be involved in to create what the tools they need that to support are, because it, it, it differs a lot from school to school and teacher to teacher. Um, and so I think for us, I think that that has been a tricky part in having these conversations. People want a lot of really hard specifics, um, which is hard to do when you're saying we don't want to tell you what to do. We want to bring the community together to solve this problem because that's really the only way to handle it. Um, and a lot of times that throws people off. But it's like moving forward, we have to collectively be fully invested in all aspects of our schools to see them be successful and to make sure that our students are getting educated. Rob, do you have anything to add? Man, it's hard to add to that because that was perfect. Um, yeah, the these things don't happen in in you know saying in a vacuum. So it's you know so the solutions to specific problems that are happening at specific schools need to be handled in specific ways that only that school could be able to address. So you know if there are issues that are you know so you. Kevin is absolutely correct. It has to be a collaborative effort. Um, don't be afraid. School districts can't be afraid to ask parents and community members to be involved in that because they bring something to the table that, you know, another lens, another perspective that the teachers and administrators may not, may not have seen and may, have, may help them solve the problem better than they ever thought it would get solved. So 
to be able to say that w what are some specific things that teachers should do in these specific situations. I mean, I, I know I know Kevin talked about the discipline matrix that that they're talking about that they have there, and we we have the same issue in LA that you know yeah, there's a discipline matrix, but we we don't want to say that you have to specifically do X, Y, and Z because that you know it, because that may not solve the issue at the time that you're dealing with. So you have to be flexible enough to say, hmm, in this situation, what what's possible? What's what's possible that you get to the root cause that where where you know at the end of the day we're moving forward in a positive way. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good answer. I think um, yeah, it's it's probably yeah. So I guess short short answer is that maybe such a list does not exist right now. Um, but it, it looks different, you know, a list, this kind of list would look different for different schools and different, with different needs and different, you know, demographics of students and, and different issues that they deal with. So that's something that would have to be worked on, you know, um, a kind of list of these supports would have to be worked on collaboratively, it sounds like you guys are saying. Yeah, and I would just also just add, like, like, like I think what's really helpful is, is best practices of like what's really been successful a lot of other places and things that people can kind of see and examine whether or not they would work at their school site to kind of help guide teachers. Um, one unique thing in our district is the fact that some high schools have started doing restorative practice kind of by themselves, which have led to kind of like the wild, wild west of discipline where no one really understands what's happening. There's not a lot of accountability and there's not a lot of um, support for teachers. Um, and so they are really opposed to the idea of restorative practice because of that reason. Um, and so I think what we try to do is try to provide them with some of the some of the things that go beyond just what they're doing at their school to what they could possibly have. Okay. Um, so I know we have just three minutes left um, and I see one other, um, oh, I see a question. Um, or I think a clarification. It's just that um, Dave says that he believes that some of the supports which will satisfy teachers aren't just the benefits of restorative discipline. They're also added supports above and beyond RJ and PBIS themselves, such as specially skilled aides or supervised um, timeout room with skilled staff or other provisions. Um, and um, and so they're kind of looking for materials that will help support efforts to convince teachers that processes being designed will provide them with tools, um, um, situational tools for handling discipline problems in order to get the best outcomes. And so I think that question is coming from that their roadblocks um, are that teachers um, just see this as more work. Um, and and that's true. I mean, that's very real. That's I think that's very that that's a lot of the issue. And and some of I think the you know if um, and I I think public council is doing a little bit of work um, in that area. And I think we can um, further hash out you know especially and create materials that have um, or some sort of tool that in, explains these um, these uh, these supports that teachers need. Um, and in order to, as an advocacy tool, I guess, with teachers and, um, and for you all. So let's, I, I think, you know, this is a, that's a really rich discussion and we should get into it a little bit more um, offline, especially since we have just uh, two minutes left. And so in this last two minutes, I just wanted to um, say that um, people should feel very free to um, contact me directly. Um, my, my email and phone number have been up on the screen for a little while, as well as Rob and Kevin's phone numbers. Um, and um, and I, if you have any further questions, you want to, you know, hash out these ideas about creating these tools that um, situational tools for teachers or or um, further working on things, please, please, please do not hesitate to contact us. I mean, those. I, this is what helps the work um, continue is that, you know, we all have ideas and maybe, you know, are thinking about different things that could really help advocate and, um, and bring our points across. Um, I will be sending um, a follow-up survey um, for everyone um, and also um, 
for those of you who were unable to um, access the the PowerPoint from this um, from the material section, please feel free to email me, and I will send it um, to you pretty immediately. Um, and um, and I would really really like to thank Rob and Kevin, who are active organizers, for taking an hour and a half out of their very busy days to. Um, help me um, bring this webinar to you all. So um, I'd really like to thank you guys personally. Thank you. And, um, and yeah, um, and uh, please feel free to um, contact us and have a great day. Thanks everyone.